Let's talk filler metal. This is a basic video on some concepts on selecting filler metal. So I want to make three quick points before we get into the meat of the video. Point number one is you can't always select your own filler metal. Sometimes it is specified in a document like a welding procedure. A welding procedure specification or WPS for short. If the WPS says ER70S2, that's the filler metal. That's what you use. Point number two is there are some good resources out there. There's no point in just guessing what might work or just asking somebody. There's good resources out there to guide you, especially for aluminum and for stainless. And I'll provide those here as well as in the text under, under this video. Point number three is stick with the usual suspects. Don't go off the reservation and, and think, I'm going to use a special rod here. Use, use tried and true filler metals where there's some substantiation behind it. Technical literature, textbook, ASM book. AWS book. Don't go off the reservation. Let's get into it. First up, because it is the most commonly welded category of metals, carbon steel and 4130 chromoly and things like that. For plain carbon steels like A36 structural steel, 1010 to 1020 steel, that includes 1018 steel, most all steel tubings, ER70S2 and ER70S6 are the main two filler metals. There's not a lot of difference between the two, except when you're penetrating all the way through to a backside that's not shielded. But look, here is ER70S6. Here is the finished product of ER70S2. Not that much difference. A lot of people think that ER70S6 has a lot more oxidizers. What it has is more silicon, but ER70S2 has additional oxidizers like zirconium, titanium, and aluminum in addition to other things. So they're, they're kind of interchangeable, except when a WPS specifies one. But if you have a choice, just go with personal preference. Here's a quick tip for those short little runs of MIG wire that you have left over when you have to change a liner out. 035 and 030 are kind of flimsy and kind of have a curvature, but if you twist them up, they're kind of like a, using a piece of 1 16th filler. Much more usable, much more feedable, can get you out of a jam in a pinch. For motorsports and uh, aviation, 4130 chromoly tubing is, is commonly welded with ER70S2 or ER70S6 and sometimes ER80SD2. All depends on what the most desired result is. Is if it's complete strength or is it a combination of strength and ductility, things like that. The ADSD2 will give you more strength, but strength isn't the only thing you're looking for. You need ductility and elongation too. There's been a lot of research going into welding 4130 chromoly tubing, and the result is that 0.12 wall thickness and below can be welded with ER70S2 without a preheat. Anything over 0.120 wall thickness definitely could use a preheat. It won't hurt to preheat uh, 1 thousandths wall thickness, but it's not necessary. And on a joint like this, a lot of times pulsing the pedal is a common technique used in motorsports industry. On 120 wall DOM tube, just which is just plain steel, like 1020 steel, ER70S2 is as good as anything. For really thick, low alloy steels like 4140, a preheat is used. But you can still use ER70S2 filler sometimes. In this case, the, the strength is basically designed in. It's not relying on the strength of the filler metal. And when that's the case, it sometimes is a good idea to use an undermatching filler metal that's more ductile. Stainless steel sometimes welded without filler metal. That's called autogenous welding. And a really good example of that is for sanitary stainless tubing for food service industry. The main thing here is the inside, not so much the outside, not really worried about the outside, it's not high pressure or anything, but the inside needs to be completely purged and silver and smooth and free from sugaring where bacteria can nest and grow. You want a silver purge on food service tubing for stainless steel. Stainless steel kitchen equipment like sinks and things like that are often welded without filler metal just doesn't require much strength. It's, it's more an issue of appearance and cosmetics 
and smooth finishes to avoid trapping of bacteria. 304L stainless is the most common stainless steel and it's welded with 308L filler metal. But there are tons of other stainless steels. Two of the next most common are 316L and 321. 316 is used where corrosion resistance is the main thing and 321 is used in motorsports and aerospace for high temp performance. Whenever stainless steel is going to be penetrated all the way through, there needs to be an argon purge on the back side. In this case, the wall thickness is about 0.120, 120 thousandths, not a whole lot of risk of penetrating through, so no purge is needed. So then the main concern is not keeping stainless too hot for too long, because when you do that, you risk carbide precipitation. And that means that you're losing the corrosion properties of the stainless steel. So you want to get moving on stainless steel and keep moving and outrun the heat. Chill bars can help a lot in that regard. Heat input is not always just amperage. Heat input is affected by travel speed and it's affected by the quench factor. How much mass is around it that can pull the heat out. And so if you can add chill bars, you can help keep the stainless properties. 309L is often used to weld carbon steel to stainless steel. In this case, the stainless steel flange is welded to a carbon steel pipe using ER309L. That's what it's designed for, but it's also good for a lot of other things. It's, a lot, it's really good for dissimilar metals. It's good for when you don't exactly know what kind of steel you're dealing with. It's a good maintenance rod. Now, when the weld is a critical weld and it's going to hurt somebody if it fails, that's different. You really need to know what kind of metal it is. But sometimes you need to modify a wrench or something like that. It's, you know it's a chrome vanadium alloy, but you don't know exactly the alloy. 309 will get you by in a pinch on things like that. Let's talk about aluminum filler metal basics now. There's a lot to unpack here. Two of the most commonly used aluminum filler metals are 4043 and 5356. There are several aluminum alloys where you could use either one, but there is an important thing to note, and that is when the part will be anodized after welding, welds made with 4043 will usually turn black after being anodized. That's usually not something a customer is going to be happy with. And this shot doesn't have anything to do with that, but it's a cool shot with a clear cup, and I think it's pretty awesome. A lot of stuff is made out of aluminum tread plate, and it looks really cool. Tread plate comes in 6061, 5052, 3003, and probably a few others. And something a lot of people probably don't know is that those truck boxes that are made out of tread plate, a lot of times those are welded with thinly sheared off strips of scrap tread plate. Sometimes the, the manufacturers are so cheap, they don't even want to buy filler metal. They'll just use strips of tread plate. That's something that might get somebody out of a pinch on a Sunday afternoon when you can't get filler metal. You could shear off a thin, a thin strip of the sheet that you're welding and use it for filler. Not always. 6061 doesn't really work well like that, but some others might. 4043 and 5356 aluminum filler metals cannot be strengthened much at all by heat treat. Other filler metals are needed when a post-weld strengthening heat treatment is called for. So here's an example of a 6061 hydraulic tube where 4643 filler metal was specified by the customer so that this part could be heat treated and the weld could be strengthened just like the base metal doesn't really help to strengthen the base metal if the weld is the weak point. So in this case, again, 4643 filler metal was used, specified by the customer. The part was then heat treated after welding so that it could all be brought up to a higher strength. Cast aluminum comes in several different alloys, but one of the most common is 356. There are also 355, 357, and a host of other different casting alloys, but it the filler metal you use kind of depends on your most wanted outcome. And a lot of times for castings, your most wanted outcome is eliminating porosity. So 4047 usually helps there. 4047 is actually considered a brazing rod just because it melts slightly lower temperature 
than the base metal, just a couple hundred degrees. But that's enough to make it wet out really well and use a little bit less heat so you don't have to penetrate the base metal. You don't have to draw out the, the soaked impregnated oil that might be in a casting. 4047 is a really good filler metal to have on hand for cast aluminum. 6061 is a commonly welded aluminum and can be welded with several different filler metals. 4043, 5356, 4943. 5356 has a higher strength than 4043, but if the service temperature is 150 Fahrenheit or higher, 5356 should not be used. This is a 6061 automotive intake being welded with 4043 filler. This is an example of a part that might exceed 150, might not, low stress, so you probably get away with either 4043 or 5356, probably just wouldn't matter. Okay, for the resources now that I spoke about earlier, Alcotec is under the ESOB umbrella now, but they still have a really good aluminum filler metal chart online. You'll just Google that or go to the text underneath this video. You'll find it. You can download it. Another resource for stainless is Washington Alloys Stainless Selector Guide. You can just Google that and that chart looks like this. It has recommendations for all kind of combinations of steels and stainless steels. I mentioned earlier that 309 filler rod was a really good maintenance rod for dissimilar metals. You're going to see 309 referenced in this chart a lot.